Good. Oh, for the first time. Q, we have thumbnails on Zapdos stream for the first time. Are we all? Oh, I'm not on there, though. Damn it. Yeah, you got to learn how to use it. <laughs> Bro, I, like, connected my Albi this morning. I got to say, like, I am grateful for all these products showing up, but I was just complaining to Tino, our producer. Complaining is the wrong word, but expressing grievance over the UI of both Noster and Zapdot stream. And, yes, like, attack me, tell me I'm a noob, scrub, whatever you want. Um, simplicity is key to scaling, in my opinion, but that's just one humble it's, man's opinion. I, I don't think I've ever seen a simpler streaming platform than Zapdos Stream. Well, really? Because yeah. last I checked, there, there, we had... there, there, there are, if you want to do some kind of extra things, there's kind of some, some technical hurdles and, and and a little bit of a learning curve but it really it doesn't get more simple than this there's a big home page everyone that's live is on it you can send bitcoin directly to them ask questions give comments it's awesome i i i disagree it depends it depends what clients you're looking at but i think zap.stream is among like a pretty user-friendly experience there's only like six buttons <laughs> Fair, but until until this stream starts showing up on my Zap.stream account, it is difficult to use. Oh, you know why it won't show up on your Zap.stream account, right? I have because I, I have sats. You have to, yeah, but you have to move the sats from your one Bitcoin wallet to uh, Zap.stream to a wallet that can... Uh, no, dude, I, I connected my screen. wallet to Zap.stream. You did? Did you top up the account though? The there's account a, has more than enough sats. Well, the like wallet that, may have more than enough sats, but the Zap.stream account, you have to actually top up. Uh, so, so it doesn't pull, it doesn't authorize transactions directly from your wallet. You have to fill that side of things, if that makes sense. I'll show you after the show. All right. All right. All right. Well, I, I sent my some. I sent myself some zap. So twice now, twice <laughs> you're, now. You're the guy spoofing Zap dot stream and Primal to get on the leaderboards and the most zapped. You're just sending yourself zaps. Pretty much, um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. We, nothing. Nothing has changed literally since the last stream in terms of price, sats per dollar, or market cap. We're sitting just under 500 bills. We've got 3,900 sats per dollar, 25,640 dollars per Bitcoin, if you care about such things. Um, important one I wanted to add to the kind of daily uh, stats reading today is having versus block time. So the having estimate right now, if we have a consistent 10 minute block time, we won't, but this is just sort of an aggregate average of what you know, with all the diff, uh, hash rate difficulty adjustments should should fall around 10 minutes. That would put the next halving on April 26, 2024. So let's see how many days until April 26, 2024. You got to be careful doing this because Google is wrong sometimes about these. Uh, about 232 days. All right. So on the low estimate, we're looking at April 3rd. On a high 11-minute block time estimate, we're looking at May 19th. So you've got 200 to 260 days until the halving to get your life together, accumulate as much Bitcoin as possible. I have I don't know why, but just because with some of the institutional news and especially some of the news that came out today, we're going to start talking about. I think we might be in for a kind of a having price appreciation that's that's priced in a little bit earlier than in past years. In history, this is kind of the apex, the time between the having and Bitcoin reaching its fiat price height has kind of extended between six to 18 months. I think it's going to be a little bit sooner this year as education ramps up and as more people try to outbid each other to scoop up those sats earlier, knowing what's coming. Um, that's my prediction. What do you think, Q? Uh, I mean, look, I, I'm a firm believer in the four-year cycle. Oh, no, he said it. He said the awful words. Um, yes, you know, it, it's literally the greatest invention ever, given the fact that you can pre-plan for it, and yet at the same time, that supply squeeze 
is significant enough. Um, if you actually follow the mining space, even a little bit, you're, you're aware of hash price and you're aware of sort of where profitability lies for these miners. And we have to kind of realize like, Hey, that gets, that also gets cut in half or actually it technically doubles. Um, you know, the cost per basis for Bitcoin right now, I think it was estimated at like $18,000 to run a, one miner profitably. That's going to cost twice as much when the block reward is actually cut in half. And so you will see a supply squeeze happen. And as a result, the, the theory should stand and we should actually see higher Bitcoin prices on the other side of the happening simply because the block reward is cut in half. A, crazy you can expect it all you want but the actual effects of the supply squeeze will just cause a price appreciation granted demand stays set steady and we don't fuck up the protocol between now and the halving by implementing something like drive chains or tail emissions and ruin the incentives of the whole protocol right yeah demand has to stay steady for that for that model to work but i agree with you true but i would even go so far as to say like this is not an endorsement of drive chains. I think they're silly, unnecessary. Who's but... endorsing drive chains? Yeah. Clip it. Clip it, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> You're literally going to watch the clip say, I do. do uh, 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 uh. Anyways, um, I do believe, however, that the fraction of the total Bitcoin population, specifically Bitcoiners who are stacking sats who are accumulating bitcoin that demand will not change and instead you will see the demand coming from non-regular bitcoiners if you will maybe people who have bitcoin but have since been more focused on shit coinery and you could act actually see an increase in demand as a result of that um but that that is only if the vast majority of Bitcoiners just more or less ignore Bit three hundred, and then other other coiners, shit coiners. I don't know what, how we want to phrase it. They would then drive demand higher while supply is cut in half, so a double whammy. So it's you almost think it's like, the plebs. You think it's the plebs moving the price? No, no. It's the institution. No. Should we get no. into our first story of the day? Uh, do you want to do uh, yeah that's a great segue to the story why don't you set up the stage yeah all right so yesterday the financial financial accounting standards board voted in favor of fair value accounting for bitcoin this is huge um michael saylor has been chief among other uh corporate heads uh lobbying for this for a long time and writing the fasb i mean there have been over 300 letters written per year um, to have these standards amended. Uh, Bitcoin, until now, has been treated as an intangible asset, uh, whereby if you held Bitcoin on the balance sheet, just held it. You didn't sell it. You had to take an impairment when the price went down. So you saw that with Tesla and SpaceX. Um, you know, they're kind of very simple minded uh, cohort. Uh, did not understand that the Tesla didn't sell. It can actually hurt the stock price because they're looking and seeing like, what is this huge impairment on the balance sheet? Oh, it's that damn Bitcoin that's highly volatile, ruining everything. The problem is you didn't get an actual read of the health of the company, um, you know, on a regular basis because they weren't allowed to mark up unrealized gains on their bitcoin so they could only impair their balance sheet downward they received no benefit from price appreciation of bitcoin so those quarters when sailor was just killing it i mean basically microstrategy is always killing it outperforming s p outperforming bitcoin itself um much of the time their balance sheet actually didn't reflect that that crazy price appreciation from the first time they bought maybe bitcoin was around I want to say 18, 19K. Does that sound right? It's like I think it was less. Ago now. No. Even I think, less? I think okay. it was less. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, even better. I mean, when it went up to 70K, they did not get to mark 
that mark to market on their balance sheet. So this is huge because think about the disincentive as a public company. You're trying to convince your board, you know, to adopt Bitcoin, whatever governance body, and you can only impair it downward and you, you, you don't actually get to reap the benefit in your quarterly or, you know, however often you, you, you report to the public and to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, generally just the public. That's a pretty big disincentive, uh, disincentive not to adopt Bitcoin. So I think this is huge. This will lift a lot of hurdles. Technically, these rules don't go into effect until 2025. But I think, I think that I read that these companies are allowed to start impairing. Uh, sorry, not impairing. They're start. They're allowed to mark the unrealized capital gains of their Bitcoin, um, basically ASAP, and it's just going to kind of go unchecked. So that's huge. I think that that will definitely sway some companies that were on the fence, um, and over time. Basically, you're going to see a game theory play out where all the wonderful benefits of adopting Bitcoin and getting a, even a little exposure on the balance sheet are going to push more and more institutions to join. It's just going to it's just going to help us with that price appreciation. And I think generally this is just a sign of confidence in this um, basically sector of Bitcoin. And to be fair, other, other cryptocurrencies as well. It's not, it's not just Bitcoin that they amend. Oh man, Bitcoin. you're drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm drinking man, the Kool-Aid. You're drinking the Kool-Aid. You're so, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm never this mean, but you're just so wrong. And I will explain to you very easily why you are wrong. Uh -huh. What happens when you can say you made money in this country? What happens? If you uh, report that you make money, what do you have to do as a result? You don't have to pay taxes on your unrealized Bitcoin gains. Oh, okay. Then never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I was so, I was like, where the fuck is he going with this? <laughs> no, well, I, not not yet anyway. Not yet. I mean, there we, 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 we saw the also, Biden administration bring this up a few times. I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to do it. They'll tax I mean, look, they, can. they haven't actually released the rules. So... I don't think we can That's fair. comfortably say yes or no. Where my head has gone on this is, oh, they're going to tax this. And yeah, it's unrealized gains. But I genuinely believe that this is going to be a really contentious thing. I'm, I'm rooting for it because this, I mean, from... Um, from the perspective of someone who just wants their bag pumped, this is the most bullish thing to happen in Bitcoin. Arguably in the last like six months. Like realistically. Sure. From, from a strictly, corporate adoption standpoint. Strictly think... from a price, like all the price can get pumped off of this news. This is a huge story. From what's being built or done, what types of products are coming out, how is the user uh, interface on certain apps, how easy is it to spin up a lightning wall, these types of things, like this, this is irrelevant. Um, but it opens the door in, in a really weird way. Like for example, that SpaceX story that everyone was talking about, oh, Elon sold his uh, Bitcoin that wasn't really the story. It was to go off of this conversation. Like they had to mark the value of the asset lower and take those losses as though they had sold it. But as Bitcoin goes back up, based on current rules before this came out, they would they wouldn't have been able to do so. But with this new ruling in place or with this new decision in place and the rule pending. It'll be interesting to see, I think, what the parameters are um, because it, it, it could be as simple as, yeah, 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 you could do it, but then you have to pay a 10% tax rate on it. Like, could, you could you imagine having to pay taxes on the way up and then like reporting yeah. it on one quarter report and then seeing in the next these quarter? Are, these are different agencies that, that do these things, though. It's still the government. Right, but You're the FASB, the FASB is not going to tax people. 
Um, right, but that's they not how be- that works. So the rule has to be implemented, and then maybe other tax uh, decisions are made later. But I think that would that would create massive protests because that is way broader market implications. If you have to, if businesses have to pay unrealized uh, capital gains taxes on all the assets that they hold, I think what you if would it's have not all the assets they hold. What if it's only one? What if it's only, only on Bitcoin? Bitcoin? What if it's only on Bitcoin? Uh, I don't know. We can what about them all day, but I don't True. see any indication that's going to happen. That that would be insane, though. Um, the next question of the day is, why am I so blurry? Oh, my <laughs> God. How does Q have better? I have better signal, according to Restream. What is going on here? Um, I mean. This looks terrible. Are you sure your video setting is set to HD or higher? Let me check it out. Yeah, we're on HD. Uh, okay, it must be must be the signal somewhere along the line. That's pretty. That's pretty uh, disappointing. Can um, someone in any of? I just want to quickly shout out Rumble, YouTube, Twitter, Zap.Stream. I'm probably missing one of our platforms, but can someone on any of these platforms? Please write a comment or something letting us know if you can even decipher half of Alex's end pub that he has listed on his screen right there. Just half, a, a fraction, a quarter of it. Just leave us a comment. Let us know. Uh, if you do, we'll we'll release his private keys. Not with the current the current uh, blur factor is going to make it impossible. But uh, all right, let's move on to our next story of the day. It's been exactly two years since El Salvador became the first nation to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Super exciting. So, I mean, since then, generally, tourism is up hugely in the country. Uh, Volcano Bitcoin mining is evidently live. I don't know if those volcano bonds ever happened. Uh, They were... I thought they were... They're still working on it. That's insane. And then, uh, I mean, partly because aren't they issued on liquid? That's, that, that might be the problem right there. And then uh, Bukele has bought over 2,500 Bitcoin uh, on, behalf of the, on behalf of the state. Um, oh, yeah, and also rounded up um, 30,000 people and disappeared them off the streets in the matter of... No, no, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. Oh, sorry. That's not related to Bitcoin. No, no, oh, okay. no, no. This is... This yeah. is... <laughs> no trial, no jury. Just let me, okay, let, let me ask you this <laughs> genuinely. Like, do you have a problem with Bukele doing that? Yeah, yeah. I have tattoos and people were arrested for less and never saw their family again. I mean, there's people and this is not, you know, like a F, uh, SBS style prison. This is like you're in like a hardcore like guantanamo bay looking prison um probably forever i mean these people are just they're just gone now i've been to el salvador i've seen it with my own eyes i've seen the benefits of that but it's not it's not what you think it is it's okay yes you take thirty thousand criminals gangsters off the street i don't know i'm not suggesting i have a better solution but what i'm saying is that affects the spirit of the people those are somebody's kids and parents and it feels like a ghost town and everyone's just terrified. Um, you know, you've got people basically like armed private security on every corner, pretty typical for Latin America, um, to be fair, but the streets are empty at night, you know, (laughs) and, uh, there's still, there actually is still kind of, um, I guess you would call it like kind of cartel gang related activities happening. Like I've, I have it on extremely good authority. I mean, this is the uh, national security advisor to the president. It's a friend of mine. I spent some time with him in El Salvador that um, most of the big Bitcoin businesses there have been basically taken over and are paying unofficial taxes to gangs. Um, so the problem still exists despite, you know, ghosting 30,000 people. So, um, you and I, I think it might have been with Pete, but like you're familiar with the story of Singapore, right? No. 
Okay. So when Singapore was first sort of fighting for its independence from Great Britain, um, the first prime minister really took an aggressive stance. He had a vision for this city state, if you will, where he wanted it to become the bridge from east to west. He mandated that all students in school not only learn their native tongue, but be taught English and Chinese. On top of that, he rounded up every single drug dealer and they were sentenced to death. And they held drug dealers to such an insanely high standard. You had a human rights group calling out this prime minister, essentially saying like he is one of the most demonic people in the world. Like how could you sentence these people to death? And his response was honestly so valid. And it was very simple. Like, this is not something acceptable in my culture. Like, we do not value this in the way that the West seems to be accepting of these types of behaviors. So don't push your value system onto me, is me paraphrasing sort of his uh, response to these human rights groups. They stood strong. They stood firm. He held his course. And here we are today. Was Singapore is one of the wealthiest nations in the world. It is, in fact, the bridge between East and West. And Bukele has been on record citing this prime minister as his sort of inspiration. And I think it was just last year he passed away, the prime minister, this first prime minister of Singapore. Mm -hmm. It was a national holiday. Everyone stopped. He is viewed as the father of Singapore because his vision. I mean, to be fair, most dictators are. The opposition isn't allowed to uh, (laughs) dissent. And that's absolutely the case in El Salvador, by the way. I don't disagree. Start writing articles uh, speaking out against Bukele in El Salvador. I just think that there there is a layer of this that has a touch of, well, we in the West don't do it that way, so you shouldn't either. And while I may not agree with, you know, locking up political descendants, I Dissidents? I don't know. I'm trying to use a big word. Dissidents. Thank you, Tino. Um, like, I, I want to see it play out. I'm sorry. Like, I, I'm an awful person for saying it, but like, I, I would rather see this man carry his vision through without Western values trying to be forced upon him because that's exactly what the IMF has done. That's exactly what the WEF does to these smaller nations. They force their value set onto them. So that that's sort of my thought process. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. Maybe this man is the worst and, you know, it will only get worse as his power strengthens or maybe, just maybe, he's on to something that we are having a hard time grasping because we wouldn't want to see it done that way in our country. But there is potential that this could work. We've seen systems like this work in the past. And he wants to make a bridge from the West to the South. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I don't know if he's a kind of like a good or bad person, benevolent or malevolent dictator. That's not really what's at hand here. I'm just saying, I don't like when any government starts to decide who lives and dies, who's free and not without any sort of due process. It's a problem. I mean, it's a maybe it's the right price to pay to kind of uh, clean up the streets and make people feel safe. El Salvador, no longer murder, murder capital of the world. I think they celebrated like a year without murders or something. I, I, I'm sorry, but I just I don't believe that statistic. I don't think that, that <laughs> a really year happened. without murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think I don't think that happens. You don't go from murder capital of the world to one full year without murders. But I don't know. It's not it's just it's important to stay critical. This is still a state actor. I mean, as Bitcoiners, you got to be very careful who we're uh, kind of promoting and, uh, you know, uplifting and celebrating. It's just, this is a fallible person. Okay. Some of his actions do align with the ethos of Bitcoin and are inarguably good for humanity. But the other point we could talk about is people in El Salvador don't give a fuck about Bitcoin. Um, that I think is the more interesting part of this. 
that. Yeah. Let me try to fix my video for a second. Q, you dive into it. So uh, I don't actually have the statistics in front of me, so I apologize. But the rollout of these Bitcoin wallets and apps has been met with a lot of resistance and questions. But on top of that, too, Alex can speak to this far better than I. I have not yet made my way down to El Salvador. May or may not be going for the having party, TBD. But that said, the what I've heard is that you don't actually have as many merchants accepting Bitcoin as we are led to believe on Bitcoin Twitter. And for I, I can share a personal story. I was working a construction job earlier this year. And I was talking to some of the workers and they were all El Salvadorian. So I, I kind of asked them point blank. I was like, Bitcoin, do you use it? What do you do? Et cetera, et cetera. And I, I talked to them sort of about their situation. They all are sending money back home to their family. What are you using? Western Union. And I, I point blank was like, Rapper, you're paying 20% or more to Western Union. Like they're taking such a big cut. If you send Bitcoin down there, like it gets there anytime you want, and you're not giving that cut. But there was there was a lot of skepticism, a lot of skepticism. People didn't seem the, the people I was speaking to here in America didn't really seem as interested in the proposition of saving that money. When I kind of pressed them, they essentially admit they were like, it, "It's less about me, and it's more about my family over there." Like they don't know how to use these things. And if I send them Bitcoin instead of like dollars, which they're used to, it's, there's a possibility that it all goes to waste, that they like never figure out how to access it in their wallet, never know how to spend it, etc. So that is a huge hurdle when we really think about it and you understand like the whole pitch was, Hey, this is a country that Western Union just like rakes in money off of. And this is something that would destroy that aspect of their business. But it's so ingrained. People are so used to, I go to Western Union, I, I send money back home to my mom or family, and that's how they receive it. This could be, a, it'll take time. This is going to take a generational shift. Um there's a good rule of thumb that I kind of, I like to use, which is your Bitcoin app is not as user-friendly as you think, unless my mom can use it. Pretty simple barometer and you can use your mom. You don't have to come bother my mom to see if she can use your app. Just, you know, hit up your own mom. Um, but that that's, that's a solid barometer in my opinion. Now, some of your moms may be more tech savvy than others. Find a less tech savvy one. You know what I'm talking about. Um, you want global mass adoption? That's where it starts. It doesn't start because, and I'm I'm gonna sound like an awful Bitcoiner for saying it. It doesn't start because some president says, "Oh, we accept Bitcoin." Yeah, cool. Bitcoin is used here. No, pe people have to use it. It's all talk unless it's actually being used on a regular basis until consistent use, not by tourists, not by Bitcoiners coming into town. Pressing the local merch. Oh, can I spend Bitcoin here? Okay, do you accept Bitcoin here? No, on a day to day basis, El Salvadorians need to be trading with El Salvadorians in Bitcoin for you to actually say that this rollout is more than just like a really fun publicity stunt to watch transpire. Sorry, sorry for the very hard, harsh truth. Um, but I, I think we sometimes need this reality check. There's there's a little bit of over exuberance, I think, sometimes when we talk about this stuff. But they got Alex is back because I was about to go down some weird rabbit holes there. I'm back. <laughs> I'm messing with my camera settings. I'm uh I'm 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 blurry as ever. Let's see. We'll find out in a second if any of it worked. But uh yeah, no, thanks for that, Q. I think, uh, you know, that about sums it up for our two stories of the day. We're very bullish on the FASB um, accounting rules update. We're very um, skeptical 
of all state actors. Bukele is no exception. However, we applaud him on uh, two years of Bitcoin adoption. You know, commend him for we didn't even did we even cover this yet? They're pushing to mandate Bitcoin as part of the state uh, education system. Q, I think you, you yeah. know more about this than I. What do you What do you think? I mean, it, it's more. It kind of goes back to the comp with Singapore, where you know the prime minister of Singapore mandated that all the students in school are going to not only be taught the native tongue in Singapore but also Chinese and English, like you are seeing a similar thing being rolled out in El Salvador where they're being told you're going to learn about Bitcoin. Um, Like, let me, let me explain this in terms that maybe a lot of Americans can understand. Like I grew up in a generation where I didn't learn computer science in school for the most part. Like what I learned was how to use Microsoft word, how to use Google search, how to use Excel Those are sort of the computer courses that I was taught. But now there are a lot of schools that genuinely teach kids different languages from very early ages. And these kids are growing up understanding how to code and build from very early ages. Part of the reason why you're seeing founders as young as we see, it's not anything to do with, oh my God, this generation is so much smarter. It's we're giving this generation the right tools early enough for them to go and explore these paths. A similar thing is going to happen in El Salvador. You're essentially combining the idea of teaching kids computer science at an early age and teaching them this language that will bring in potential business ventures into this country. I, I have very high hopes and expectations for the young generation in El Salvador. And my expectation, quite frankly, is to see some really cool products built for or on Bitcoin, oh my God, he said on Bitcoin, cancel him. Um, as a result of this and students from El Salvador, I think will be leading the charge in the next generation. You're back on camera. No, the blur is back. Um, okay, uh, appreciate it, Q. Let's get into some of the questions for the day. So uh, one question I thought was kind of interesting that we received were, was how many addresses hold at least one coin? I always, you know, from time to time, like to view this. It's basically the Bitcoin rich list. Uh, you can see how many people hold between 0.1 and 1 Bitcoin, for example. So, uh, actually, let me rephrase that. You can see how many addresses hold between 0.1 and 1 Bitcoin, which is not a direct one-to-one Basically, it's impossible to know because one person can own multiple addresses. Multiple people can have access to one address. So it's unclear. We'll never know precisely. Um, But for our purposes, we'll say people who hold between or addresses that hold between one and 10 Bitcoin, there are 860,000 of them. Uh, between 10 and 100 Bitcoin, you've got 141,000. And of course, the numbers decline as you go 100 to 1,000. You've got about 13,800 addresses between 1,000 and 10,000 Bitcoin. You've got 1,905 between 10,000 and 100,000 Bitcoin. I hope this is an exchange, uh, if not just, uh, you know, Satoshi or some some long gone OG wallet. You've got just 103 and between 100,000 and a million Bitcoin, you have just four addresses. You can check out what those addresses are online, obviously, because the ledger is uh, transparent, although pseudonymous. Um, So to go back to the original question, more than one Bitcoin, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, that's like, that's about 80, 85% of the addresses that are, 85% 85% of the total coins out there belong to addresses that have between that have more than one Bitcoin in them. So if you're out there, you're like, man, I've got a long way to go. The having still a good 230 days away. So uh, keep stacking shrimps, add more Bitcoin to your, to your stack. I like one Bitcoin as the goal. I think uh, additional kind of side quest uh, question. Q, do you think, um, 
I always believe that basically anyone could accumulate one Bitcoin. I mean, it really kind of depends what where you live in the world. But I think that let's just take Americans, for example, if they busted their ass, they could accumulate one Bitcoin between now and the halving. I think if you have Internet access and you can read and write, you should be able to you should be able to get it done. So the halving is like maybe a little bit more than six months away, but for numbers sake. To make this simple, let's just say six months. Let's also just say the price of Bitcoin is 25K. So that means you need to <clears throat> be at a savings rate of $50,000 a year and be willing to put all of that savings just into Bitcoin to get one more, one whole coin. If you were to start today, buy the happening. <sighs> to be honest with you, I think that's all. It's not easy. It's going to depend on your sort of income level and your expenses. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you have to, you have to change everything to pursue that, especially if you're, I don't know, working at a, at a grocery store or something, you know, you're going to have to get a second job. You're going to have to think of new ways to get uh, income, but I think, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. There's not, there's not, there's no, meaningful difference between those with a whole bitcoin and without right everybody benefits uh from the version of the network just by just by holding some doesn't matter the amount it's not important but it is a kind of it is always a fun goal and qualifier what are you saying i'm you gonna don't push agree? back on that you don't you you're you, you're saying there's a difference between how uh how much of a bitcoin there someone is based on how much they own no i just think that having more bitcoin does mean something <laughs> simple as that like it is a higher denomination higher value and then as a result you are theoretically more wealthy so i don't i didn't maybe rephrase what you're saying because i think the way you're phrasing it is coming off of, no, 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 no 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 this is not a oh <laughs> that was bad you were blurry um I, I don't agree with that from the aspect of it makes it sound as though like, oh, if you have half a Bitcoin, that's worth the same as having one and a half Bitcoin. Like, no. But I get, No, I, no, those are not the physically the same things. But I'm saying I don't have value judgments on people that don't have a whole Bitcoin yet. No, that's not, yeah, if yeah, you're a shrimp, no, I think your goal should be to get over one Bitcoin. And I think anyone who thinks they can't do it will not do it and they're 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 a bit weak willed and they should should apply themselves more and they, like they you, would have so maybe i am making value judgments between people who don't have, like you hurry are, up and get are, hurry up and without, get your whole bitcoin you are <laughs> making value judgments while at the same time trying to say like hey, no one's gonna judge you but i'm gonna judge you if you're just sitting on your ass stacking a dollar a day doing nothing more no than one i'm gonna i i no 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 there's a distinction i judge the people who say that's impossible you can't do it life's not fair not everyone has the same income level i'm like okay well, i've been there before too i mean work work harder get creative think outside of the box you know all you have to do is decrease your expenditure and increase your income it's simple it's the hardest thing you'll ever do good luck <laughs> <laughs> it's simple it's also just like i don't know sometimes in certain situations you can get sort of sucked in and like having a wife and kids right now and being stuck in a job that is a that is a tough spot to try to make a drastic lifestyle change um alex out here trying to dole out financial advice as a as a single father no kids um analyze and understand your situation is all i'm going to say like there's there's nothing wrong with stacking what you can um and at the same time trying to to alex's point like be creative um this is an unpopular opinion but i could say it because alex isn't here right now i hate the notion where it's like you're better off just you know stacking your sats and saving your money that way well yeah most people are most people are but if you can take a hundred dollars and get a return off of that by doing something else. And no, I'm not telling you to go on a parlay picking the Detroit Lions tonight and the Ravens on Sunday and the Cowboys Sunday night and also the Jets Monday night, like cool little money line parlay on those four. And you turn that hundred into like 600 real quick. 
not financial advice. Don't do that. But I'm thinking other ways. Like if you can, you know, quickly do something or, you know, you have access to a car and a lot of free time, like trying to just Uber a couple hours a week extra. Wow. You came back fresh. It's like a different person just joined me. Well, on Restream, I'm looking fresh. On every other platform, if it's blurry, I swear to God, I might just rage quit the stream. Do it. Let's give it a little second. It's lagging. You're <laughs> like, do it, do it. I'll take this. <laughs> these, these, these five, five, four and a half viewers are mine. <laughs> I'm, I'm slowly brainwashing them. No, you look crisp right now on all, all streaming it's, platforms. Uh, it's not terrible. It's better than it was. I'll take it. All right, let's continue. Okay, so yeah, to get back into it. Just be I creative, know, I don't, make money. Yeah, but, make money. I don't well, say it to be an asshole. I just no, no, let I me finish my rant. People. Let me finish my rant because right, right, right. I'd like I'd like your you to chime in. So where I what I've said so far, very long winded, is for most people, buying and sitting on Bitcoin is a better investment than anything else. But if you can actually take your money and have a higher return doing anything. I don't care what it is. You want to go buy a couple of vending machines and set them up? Go nuts. You want to, I don't know, fix your car up and then start driving Ubers around to make some extra cash. Or, hey, you can use that money and quickly remodel your back house and Airbnb it out or find a tenant or whatever. If you can generate some sort of returns to then have more cash flow coming in to then go and use that to buy bitcoin like by all means that's the being creative so don't let bitcoin twitter bully you into thinking that all you should do is buy bitcoin with your money uh i think in response to that i would say you should think of work that is outside of the physical realm because uh those things are all extremely limiting you have to be somewhere at a time doing material physical things that are tiring and hard there, 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 there are so many opportunities to work virtually and reach a way bigger client base and, uh, you know, work frictionless, frictionlessly. And that is what the people who are um, becoming wealthy today have figured out that you may have not. Not that there is not value in the physical world and people. I mean, I used to I used to be a landscaper. I love landscaping. Um, I think it's super fun, super rewarding work, and you can make a ton of money doing it. But you can make a lot more money, um, you know, in software as a service or even just being um, a virtual employee of multiple companies at once. Uh, there's just there's just so many ways to, to make money out there. And even just uh, broadly, I don't recommend it, but um, trading, making good, investing choices, as Q said, while weighing the risks uh, might be a good way to increase your stack now a lot of people would would kind of freak out at that how could you ever touch your stack i think it's for the majority of people it's it's a lot at the get-go to consider <laughs> burn, and you're better off just getting some exposure and holding it it's better than none but uh i think eventually there comes a time where there's some pretty obvious opportunity for pretty limited risk out there on the table and especially if you're young you got to be willing to take risks or, you know, you're not, you're not going to grow that, that kegger in the way that you should. I mean, you gotta, you gotta put some skin in the game here and, and get creative. But yeah, I, I think we've beat this question. Um, let's go into the next one. Ooh, explain how lightning network works and how it aims to solve the scalability problem. Q, do you want to, do you want to start this one? <laughs> um let me let me take a stab at this and then okay. tell me how wrong i am so bitcoin base layer there is a maximum amount of transactions that can happen at this base layer so if we actually want 8 billion people to be using bitcoin it's actually impossible if everyone only has one transaction a year, there aren't even enough transactions for 8 billion people at the base layer. Um, my source is Bob Burnett from Bitblock Boom. So if anyone was there for his talk, you can cite that. Um, Lightning is 
layer two, I guess. Yeah, because it's layer one is the base layer. Layer two is the lightning network. And essentially it is it is an instant settlement layer that instead of relying on each block to get mined in order for a Bitcoin to be transaction, it allows for Bitcoin to be sent quickly and at the same time allows for a greater number of transactions to occur, which is answering sort of the scalability problem. Now, the nuances of that, I'm going to turn it over to my lovely co-host, who's going to explain to you just how that works. Okay, uh, sure. So like you pointed out, Lightning Network's second layer solution um, to solve Bitcoin's scalability issue, uh, free and open source like Bitcoin itself, um, important distinction, it's not uh, Bitcoin itself. So there's, uh, you know, a couple of trade-offs considerations to make. And um, I think the important thing to know is it um, operates on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, right? You sort of uh, peg in by making a transaction to open a payment channel between any two parties on this kind of new layer. Okay, so that's how it gets rooted into the main chain. And if you imagine now, rather than having to send transactions me to Q on the main chain and pay all these fees to miners, we can simply open a channel between us on this extra layer, pay one fee, and then route payments uh, in a much more frictionless way, virtually for free, for very, very low fees uh, between that channel we created. Um, it is hub and spoke, so we can also route payments through other channels, any other channels that we connect to. Um, you don't even have to run your own so server and uh, you know spin up your own channels. In Lightning, you can simply use other people's uh, the services, uh, custodial kind of Lightning services. These channels they can exist for as long as needs as need be, um, and. I mean, the important thing to remember is that because they're established on top of Bitcoin uh, rather than on the main base layer, the transactions are faster. They're not subject to the 10 minute block time. They're virtually instantaneous and uh, the fees are much, much lower. You're talking a couple sats rather than, I don't know, 12 cents or <laughs> whatever the fee rate happens to be at Bitcoin. You know, with all with all these, uh, you know, that's one of the complaints you get it with uh, inscriptions. They're clogging up the blockchain. It's going to be impossible for people to open lightning channels in the future and make payments on the base chain. Um, I think, as we pointed out earlier, this was always an issue with Bitcoin. I mean, this taproot activation just made us contend with this problem a lot sooner. I think a lot of the friction people are feeling there is uh, Bitcoin's a free market. Uh, Bitcoin's a commons. I want to, you know, tell people how to use it. No, it's free. Anybody can use it how they want. And, you know, people are clashing over that because the reality is uh, it's both. So I think the stance of me and I, I don't know about Q, but is uh, you can use Bitcoin for whatever you want. I, I don't give a fuck. It's your money. Um, I'm just happy that you're not using the state's money. Um, do whatever you want with it, you know, for good or for evil, that's on you. Um, I don't personally choose to use it for inscriptions. And I think opening lightning channels is a much more valuable use of block space for me personally, but I do not pretend to tell other people what is a valuable use of block space. That's bullshit. Um, block space is scarce. People value it for different reasons. Um, there's no, <laughs> there's no situation where people basically that subscribe, uh, subscribe to that ideology that, um, you know, inscriptions are inherently bad. That is a bad use of block space. What you're saying is that there is inherent value in, in things. And I don't agree with that at all. I think value is in all cases subjective and it's in the eye of the user or, um, beholder. Um, there's not, you know, this kind of baseline utility thing. That really doesn't that really doesn't exist. OK, then you get into the game of like, well, why is Bitcoin inherently valuable? Well, it's not inherently valuable. OK, you know, Jimmy Diamond doesn't give a fuck about Bitcoin because he doesn't need to. You know, <laughs> there's the people on Earth who don't have Internet access are not going to care about Bitcoin. They don't value it. They're going to value, you know, they're going to have some other commodity to meet their uh, coincidence of wants. Um, 
outside of that. So I, I don't know. That's kind of a longer rant, um, I guess, on the more philosophical side about why lightning may or may not be important to you. I like using Bitcoin on the base layer. Yeah, it costs more in fees, it's, but it's, it's fun to surf the mempool and send transactions through it. And you're not going to get to do it forever. And when Bitcoin is uh, really um, pumping for block space and, and it gets really competitive and the fees go through the roof, you think twice before making those transactions, believe me. Um, now I'm a kind of set it at a low fee rate and forget it kind of guy. And uh, as long as I don't get booted from the mempool, you know, those transactions I know eventually go through if it takes a couple of days. Um, but there will be come a time, I think probably sooner than we all think as demand for Bitcoin block space increases. You know, this is the other kind of double scarcity. It's both block space and, you know, Bitcoin itself uh, that is scarce. I think we're all going to have to move on to new layers. Lightning is one solution it kind of saddens me that we don't have uh, more widely adopted competing solutions. Um, there are definitely issues and vulnerabilities uh, with lightning, not to FUD the tech, but to point to it as kind of this perfect catch all solution to scaling is incorrect. Um, so I don't know with that. I mean, I'll, I'll say it's great. More transactions, more throughput without clogging up layer one. Um, to a great extent, it does address the scalability issue. Now, can it serve 8 billion people in its current form? I don't think so. I couldn't tell you technically why, but just my experience with it is that it's um, sometimes clumsy and uh, doesn't really work. And people a lot smarter uh, than me would, would protest that claim. So uh, with that, I'll pass it. I'll pass it back to you, Q. I mean, what do you think? Are you a lightning guy? Do you run a Do you run a lightning node? If you want to share, um, I'll admit I don't run a lightning node. I almost roll my eyes when someone's like, "Send me a lightning invoice." I'm like, <laughs> truthfully, <laughs> um, did you know there are different types of lightning invoices? Q? I did not. Yeah, there's multiple implementations of lightning. The, I, I don't think I told you this, but I also like lot like I'm I'm a real Bitcoiner because I actually lost a wallet. Um, when I got a new phone, I like forgot that I had a wallet on the old phone with like I think it was like close to 500 USD of Bitcoin that I received from Lightning addresses that I just like sort of I, I like left it there, didn't realize I had it, and. When I realized after I'd sent the phone back to the phone company, I was like, fuck. The amount of Bitcoin on there is probably worth as much as the phone. So you're saying you were using a self-custodial service and you didn't have any kind of backups? You're just freeballing it? Just no 12 words? <laughs> Nothing? Like, I didn't realize that I, like, I looked everywhere that I would have kept a seed phrase and I like never found it. And that sounds like that one time the day that I realized that moon is uh, not self custodial. Oh, they this don't was follow. Yeah. This is super irritating. They don't follow the, the tried and true battle tested standards of backing up your Bitcoin. Um, and their, their lightning is actually synthetic lightning. And there's just like all these trade-offs about the, the two of two multi-sig that make it. I mean, I basically had a hard time using it since I thought it was super fast and convenient until I ran into this. And then I was like, no, this is awful. I don't want to have to send a transaction to recover my Bitcoin. That's not a good recovery standard. I want to sweep for free. Um, cool. I mean, I think we did a pretty good job of like an entry level explanation um, of how Bitcoin works, right? You're opening a channel between two parties. You can connect to more uh, from your Lightning node and just kind of extend this hub and spoke network. Um, we'll have to pull up a map sometime and show all the uh, public lightning channels in the world and where they're connected to. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting to see um, just how many tens of thousands of channels there are and how many Bitcoin are on a uh, lightning network, like the channel capacity in total or the lightning network capacity in total is pretty exciting. Let's see if I can find that. Do you want to dig into our last question, Q, while I look for that? Sure. So how might the diminishing return rewards for miners affect the security of the network in the future? Um, 
this kind of goes back to what we were talking a little bit with the supply shock, like the diminishing rewards is in reference to the happening block. The block size will continuously get smaller on a roughly four year. It's what, uh, 250,000 blocks. Wait, uh, the block, can you hear me? The block yeah. subsidy, not the block, uh, size, just a small correction. The block okay. subsidy will get smaller, not the block size. No, 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 sorry. Yes, that's what I like. The block reward. Got it. Yeah, continue. Um, there is the risk that with a diminishing reward, you know, you can arguably let's say the price never moves up. With the diminishing reward, it becomes easier to attack because the cost becomes less and less over time. That's where the price appreciation starts to play a factor into the security of the network. Over time, we've we've seen this over three cycles. Um, so that is our source right now. But on each of these happenings, we've seen a significant price appreciation as a result. And the expectation is that you should continue to see this appreciation on these happenings, which would then theoretically be able to increase the cost of an attack vector on Bitcoin. Um, and this isn't even... But the price isn't directly correlated. Can you talk about why? It's it's the hash rate. It's the hash rate that protects the well, network. It's the amount of miners mining and how competitive that becomes and how expensive it becomes to mine a block. Because if you think about it, uh, you could say you could say that, uh, you know, I mine a new block, I get to construct that block template, I get to decide which transactions are in that block, you know, I can, you know, if I had that power many blocks in a row, like probabilistically, I won't, but I could maybe do some devious things, make some, make some, uh, you know, undo some transactions, maybe some kind of double spend attack. But the problem is the it's too expensive to do so because of the amount of hash rate that's online. Although the hash rate fluctuates, it's so distributed um, that it keeps it keeps things competitive. It keeps one person from taking all the hash power and, and forcing kind of non consensus rules on chain. So it's not directly correlated to the price. It's more like the price incentivizes more miners to come online. More miners coming online increases the total network hashing uh, rate. The hash rate going up makes miners less profitable and decreases the probability that they're going to find a block. Less profitability and higher hash rate means, I mean, less uh, profitability and odds of finding a block means some miners are going to be outcompeted. They got to switch their, their miners off. The hash rate drops. Um, as a result, you know, the cycle continues, miners get excited, turn, turn the miners back on. So this is like an evolving process where these miners, like what's really important to understand is these miners get their revenue from two places. One is the block subsidy itself. Um, and the other is from fees from Bitcoin mining fees. So when you have something like um, some change in the network, ordinal inscription suddenly brings a boon of um, transactions on the base layer. You had miners, I think we've discussed this previously, that were reaping in more rewards from the fees than the subsidy itself, which is uh, kind of an anomaly, but definitely a good direction. Because uh, when Bitcoin first started, the, the Bitcoin mine per block was 50. Okay, and then after the first halving, you know, four years later in 2013, 50% of the network was mined, actually, fun fact, that dropped that subsidy that the miners were receiving every block dropped to 25 Bitcoin. Um, so now you have 75% of the network mined. Four years later, it dropped to 12.5. And after this most recent halving, the third halving, you had, you know, 50 plus 25 plus 12.5. You had 87.5% of the network, um, uh, percent of the Bitcoin mined. Third having dropped the block subsidy to 6.25 uh, Bitcoin per block, which is where we sit now. So in the earlier example, I was giving inscriptions 
uh, we're sometimes providing miners with additional revenue up to and above 6.25 Bitcoin as well. So they were really getting more like 13 Bitcoin for mining a single block. So you can imagine the insane sort of competition that ensues to uh, be the person to solve the nonce to, you know, construct that block and reap the reward from the corn coin base and get those virgin Bitcoins, but also that the, the user revenue. Okay, so that being said, what's going to happen at the halvening specifically in this fourth halvening? So you've got the 50 Bitcoin per block, 25 Bitcoin per block, 12.5 Bitcoin per block, plus the 6.25 Bitcoin per block. You add up these percents, the network will be 93.75% mined on the fourth halving. And the block subsidy will be cut in half. This happens every four years again. So the subsidy will be reduced. Miners will be rewarded 3.125 Bitcoin per block. That sucks because that cuts their revenue in half. So that sucks for them. It makes this game way more competitive and way more expensive. And their ability to service all the debt they've taken out, you know, the tens of millions of dollars to purchase these machines or purchase power, um, you know, and labor infrastructure, it gets cut in half unless the, the fee rate changes in some kind of way. And the, the, the problem that people are kind of complaining about right now that it has always been there, there's nothing kind of new, um, is that eventually the block subsidy will basically run out. It'll become so small, it'll become insignificant. Uh, is it 2140? The last uh, kind of block subsidy will hit. There's, there's a year, you know, kind of just after our lifetimes where basically there will not be a block subsidy and miners will have to mine purely for the Bitcoin they receive in fees. Now, by this time, we there's a couple schools of thought you could say that the bitcoin network will be so big and popular that the the fee rates will price out regular retail users and it will be kind of institutions competing for really high fees um which you'd think would provide more than enough subsidy for the miners the the, the trick to remember here and the reason why people sometimes make really silly um they propose really silly ideas like tail emissions to break the 21 million supply cap to keep miners incentivized. Um, okay, first of all, you've just broken the fundamental kind of uh, incentive model for Bitcoin, which is a transparent monetary policy that is unaltering in its core features and 21 million scarce supply is like probably chief and most important among them. So you're devaluing, debasing everyone's Bitcoin further than everyone you know, out there running a node had ever agreed to. So it's a bad idea for that reason. But I think these people don't understand that it's not a necessary idea because we have this thing called the difficulty adjustment, which changes the hash rate based on the amount of hashing power that's online. Every, uh, what is it, 2,100 blocks or so. Um, so it comes about uh, every several weeks. If there are more miners online, then the difficulty adjusts uh, upward. If there are fewer miners online, the difficulty adjusts downward at the end of these periods. And that adjustment will change the incentive structure for miners to do their work. So I think the important point is it's not our job as users to pay these miners as much money possible. Like I actually want it to be high competition, low margin business. I actually want miners uh, to fail so that others may succeed and this uh, system becomes more distributed. I want more miners to come online at home outside of these pools. I want pools to be transparent. I want pools to pay out directly from the Coinbase and not to be uh, kind of third party custodians of uh, mining rewards. Um, interesting solutions for that coming soon. But I don't know, that all being said, it's it's super complicated. It's a lot to get your head around. I hope that I didn't uh, describe anything inaccurately, but just remember that the difficulty adjustment resets the table and keeps the incentive model going. 
for all miners uh, in play and, and new miners that want to kind of join this game of solving for Bitcoin blocks. So the incentives are already there. And in my opinion, they'll still be there after the block subsidy runs out, right? You're still competing for user and business fees on the network, on the main chain. So I don't know, Q, tell me, tell me if I fucked anything up or, or if you have any questions from that. But I don't know if that was the most succinct explanation, but that, that, that was my best shot off the cuff at it. Nope, I'm not speaking anymore. <laughs> I'm over two today. We're done. We'll wrap yeah. it up. Well, you're not. I will say one, one thing. Okay, one thing I do want to just, where I was trying to go with what I was saying is that while the price is not the direct thing being impacted here or having an impact, an attack, like there's always that tweet that goes out like, oh, it would cost 900 trillion or 10 quadrillion dollars to like have a 51% attack on Bitcoin's hash rate. But that also fails to account for the fact that as a bad actor would try to buy up all this energy and buy up all of this Bitcoin and buy up all of these miners, the price of these things will also naturally start to shoot up that it becomes like this almost uh, exponential curve rather than like a set like, oh, this is this is how much it costs. Like, no, if someone were to just drastically go for it overnight, like that, that line is going to just steadily continue to move higher and higher. No. Yes. Okay. The price may move higher. It may cause like a run on Bitcoin, but this, this, you don't get runaway price appreciation in any free market ever because, uh, psychologically, not naturally. naturally. Yeah. Not naturally, not naturally, but you've never seen an asset go up forever. I mean, over a long enough time period, Bitcoin does, but even that drops 70% because psychologically people can't handle it. You want your profit. If Bitcoin went to a million dollars tomorrow, I'm fucking selling. Fuck you guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, that, that is not sustainable. That's insane. Um, we'll see that happen. It'll cross $100,000 and I'll absolutely take some Bitcoin off the table because many people will. You heard it here first. Bitcoin bear Alex McShane will be selling <laughs> all of his Bitcoin. Go ahead, Tino. And why don't, why don't we not clip all of that it. for today's clip? We're not clipping that. Not all no, of it. Just, just, just clip that one segment where Alex said when Bitcoin hits a million dollars, he's selling his Bitcoin. When Bitcoin it's hits a socials. million dollars, I'm selling some Bitcoin to buy more Bitcoin when it crashes back to fucking $200,000. <laughs> um, Maybe. <laughs> it sounds like shit cornery to me uh yeah not pure enough oh shit what time is it okay it's super late uh we have one yeah. more question and then wait. i gotta go wait no no that was right no that's that it was Everything. Your last question. that's a wrap yeah. guys all right well i'm gonna try to come back with a more succinct explanation we'll dive into this more and talk mining incentives it's kind of a fun challenge it's a really complicated part of bitcoin um so cool Thanks for joining us, guys. Sorry about the blurry we'll video. Be back I Monday. That's fixed now. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll fix that up. Unless we'll something major Monday. happens, we'll be back Monday.